I'm with Simple Web Block. Oh. He, he's, he's my boss. Oh, I think I've seen. I think I've, I've seen you before. Yeah. And um, he had gone in here not so long ago uh, and talking about blockchain. Yeah. So Appar apparently, I do that. You do that. You do the blockchain sort of thing. Yeah. So, what, why are you here today? Well, side project. Mm -hmm. I'm looking into making games mm -hmm. and just to really facilitate that. Sweet. And I mean, like. It'd be nice to see if I can <laughs> eventually right. do games and blockchain and stuff. Or, interestingly yeah. enough, mm. it'd be nice to make games that kind of relate to mental health as well and kind of explain those things. Ah. So, I don't know. Mm. These things might happen. Yeah. How about you? Hi. Um, hi, Ben. Um, <laughs> Hello, Ben. So, I um, asked Matteo to do this session and I'm really interested in games. Um, and I, I published my first game in February. Um, and I came to the realisation that after like 10 years of web design, I had some of the prerequisite skills to make games, like, uh, you know, somewhat creative, some coding stuff. So I decided to make my first game, and it took me a year and a half to do it, yeah. in my own time. Because, um, like, I, I used to make, starting in 2010, like, tons yeah. of text adventure games, yep. like, like, things like that. And only recently, like, I've been looking at doing, like, 2D, and yep. it surprised me how simple it is. Like, if, if you get, like, a framework, it's just basically yeah. events and stuff. What um, would you be looking to? I mean, like it's really simple stuff, like uh, basically game maker studio. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, you know, nothing too crazy. I need to look into that because I, I use Unity, but I haven't. Yeah. I think Unity is not the like next level up, but yeah. I want something where I can basically make a 2D RPG and I can basically just tell a story through that. Yeah, yeah. And um, my the big thing I want to work on is my partner is an illustrator, mm -hmm. and she's like loves her knitting and crochet and stuff. And okay. So I want to make we want to make like this kind of 2D RPG where you can basically create teddy bears and creatures in the game, and you can either sell them. Or like make people you know, that, that, those sorts of and is that where the blockchain stuff comes in? No, 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 that's just oh, okay. work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because there is some people who are trying to put uh, assets in games on the block on a blockchain nah. as well. No, but that's more storytelling. But like yeah, eventually, yeah. for work, if we go into games, it'll be interesting to tell those yeah. stories. That's cool, man. Like um, the whole Doom Doom Network. Yeah. With their solidity, well, for, it's not really a game, but they have game game play, but yeah, yeah. Sorry, jibber jabber. No, no. That's <laughs> cool. um, how far have you got with it then so far? I haven't. I've literally only yeah. like looked start looking at two D game design like last yeah. week, yeah. and then like Tom was Tom was like, you should come to this. Like, hey. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, uh, cool. Well, let's know how far you get. But, yeah. Yeah. Do you know the, the Games Hub as well? There's, um, there's a Games Hub in Bristol where like co-working for game developers and stuff like um, They do some meetups there, so it's quite nice to come and you know chat to other game developers. And they're not they they're all like nice guys, but you have to kinda of get them talking, you know what I mean? Um, but some of them are like, you know, 
just making the first game, some of them have made ten games, so it's a real like mix. But yeah, I think it's just like that way. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Matt. Matt. Thank you. Can we find some of the So I just like to hear from you. Okay. If you could introduce the person that you just talked to and tell us who they are and why they're here, <laughs> starting from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tommy is interested in very complex games. Alex. 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 So this is Ben. Ben is here because Matteo asked Ben to help organise the uh, event. And um, he's, I think he's been making games for about 10 years. Uh, no, he made, made about 10 games. Websites. Yeah, well, well websites. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, um, but yeah, I think I, think I talked too much. And, yeah, <laughs> apologies. But yeah, it was great talking to him. <laughs> um, so this is Matt. He also works with Simple Web Block. Yeah. And he's here because he's interested in games and he's been playing Game Maker and him and his partner are looking to maybe make something together like a little 2D RPG thing in the future. Uh, this is Alex. Uh, Alex is originally from Cornwall. Uh, she's just come back off a year to travel and, and uh, new to Bristol. She's interested in the scene and works here at Cornwall and lives in Cornwall. He didn't have to talk about games. So Tom's here because he helped found Simple Web and create co parent with Gavin, so that happens. Um, and essentially, you now he's got family and he doesn't have much time to play games, but he's interested in music. So he's kind of. Hello, Tom. So, on the back. This is Heidi. Thank you. 
to help people, to make games together with other people. So I signed up for a workshop at a place called MozFest. So Mozilla is coming to London every year to run a festival of learning and web stuff. And I proposed this workshop, which was itself inspired in a hack or another workshop. <coughs> and the point of the workshop was to take old arcade games like Key You've Got, Pac-Man, and deconstruct them. So think about what are the verbs of the game, what is the game made out of, what are the actions of the verb of the, of the game, and then rebuild it around new values and messages that uh, you may want to communicate through, through your game. So, so in this case, for instance, you have a bunch of kids that are taking apart Pac-Man and returning it into a game about saving energy. And they, they just made paper of at that point. It was a very short, very short one hour workshop. But that's what, that was really inspiring for me. So I decided to move away from development and going more into really teaching. So I started working at Coded, where I met Ben. <coughs> I started becoming, well, I became a lecturer in, in game design and web design. And my teaching method is very much hands on. So I. I give people things to, for instance, a block of code or a little prototype, and I ask them to take it apart, like the Lego again, and, and, turn, and then turn it into whatever they want. So it, the fancy way to take to, to call this is constructivism. It's the idea that you have, you have an object, you have something practical, something concrete, and you use that to, to make sense of the world around you. And I found that so in the, in the last few years, I've been teaching various things among the games, and I found that the, the most powerful way to, to get people into, to get people to learn something is to ask them to make a game about something. So there is a word lingering around that you may have heard of, gamification. Has anyone heard of the word, gamification? Okay. So gamification has been called bullshit, marketing bullshit, by various people, and I think there is a point there in, in the sense that gamification sometimes can be taking certain elements of games, such as points, competition, leaderboards, and then just applying them to whatever mundane, boring stuff that you want to really engage people with or customers with, and, and then say, oh, but I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about gamification because that's something that comes up a lot in, in my talks. What I'm talking about instead is not playing games as a way to understand complex systems, but rather making games. So you can learn a lot by playing games, you can learn how to be better at playing games, but to me the, the real potential is in making a game about something that you're interested in or that you have to learn. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. This is a few years ago, I went into a secondary school in Essex and we took a similar approach. We said, take a game that you have played before, analyze the verbs of the game, the things that you can do, the actions that you can do in that game, and then add new verbs or add new messages to that game. So this is Givenopoly, which as, as the title suggests, is about it's taking Monopoly into a more charitable territory. And this is a game, I'm not sure what the initial game was, but it's a game about bullying. So this was, this was interesting to me because it was a group of people that were quite difficult to work with, difficult to engage. Like the teachers were saying, like, I don't know, if you can get them <coughs> to do anything, that would be great. So we started asking them, what, what are you interested in? What are your experiences of school? And this is how they represent a the school. The school is like a maze, it's sort of prison in a way. And what you've got to do is to escape the bullies and try to get to the principal's office or to, to get out of the school. So it was for them a way to you know, conceptualize the, the vision of the world, the thing where they spend most of their days, and turn it into a game. And then it was also a way for them to, to talk about it with other people. So, one thing that I learned by making these workshops is that giving people the choice between making a video game and making a board game, it's, uh, it's something that you know, 
video games inspire a lot of people and I think everyone wants to make a video game. Probably many of you are making video games, but the process of making a video game can be quite <coughs> time consuming. And especially if you're a beginner, you, if you ask someone to make a video game in two days, three days, whatever, they will probably get stuck with bugs. They will probably get down the route of trying to solve a very minute technical problem and not concentrating on the actual game side. And it's also quite a solitary endeavor, I find. So I now always start from making board games instead. <coughs> so I ask people to take a board game, get it played, and then turn it into something else. And I find that the process of making board games is much more, it's much more collaborative because you can put the pieces around the table and start the conversation. It's much quicker because when you play a board game, you are the game engine. So if you want to make a change to the board game, so it's just about getting an agreement between the players that this is the new rule, this is the new code that we're going to execute in our heads. And also, it's much more, uh, it's, it's easier because you don't need to learn how to code. It's just, so if you can speak, if you can move your hands with stuff, then you can make a board game. So this is how I'm now teaching. Uh, I'm teaching at Ada College in London, I'm teaching at Goldsmiths, and what I do is I get people started by making board games. And then once they are inspired, when they start to see themselves as game designers, and then take the, the things that they've learned into the real of digital stuff and code. So I would like to spend three minutes, or at least that three minutes. Talking to someone around you about a board game you played and maybe think about how you can hack it. So what things maybe you spotted in that board game that were not quite right in your opinion. And then and then we'll share that to the rest of the group. Just have a quick think about a board game you played recently. And if you, this is optional, so the first one is share with <laughs> share with someone next to you about the board game you played. And the second optional question is it's if you could change it in any way, what would you do? <coughs> Yeah, well, I can't remember the rule. Yeah. 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 Yeah
bad house is like fighting somewhere. It's not that bad. Like, you just realize that once you take charge, like, you get some tips. You have to figure out what's going on. Yeah, who was in the way? Well, you have to find out who's in the way. In fact, we used to have one because they just got the food down. The way they basically kind of got food down, they had a lot of time to figure out the rubbish. I don't know if it's fixing my mind. I don't really like that. Ah, I'm not. Uh, 
so you've got really nice people that play in peace, and it's a bit like Monopoly, they become monsters and they just <laughs> decide to destroy each other. But what do you think happens when, when you play with kids, when you ask people to play business? Good things, bad things? Good things, bad things? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. We probably share more. Yes, they do. In fact. So I was really surprised that when, when you play with kids, they really bring in their real world concerns and their friendships in the game. So they're not just distantiating themselves and saying, oh, this is just business. But many people play the game and think, what, whenever they do something horrible to, to their in real life friends, they're like, oh, this is just business. So, <laughs> you know, it gives them that um, justification to be horrible. But when you play with kids, they actually are very careful about doing anything which is considered morally wrong to one of their friends. And also they're quite careful about maintaining a certain balance in the ecosystem. So in, in the middle there you've got uh, well, chickpeas that represent natural resources. And they're very careful about how they're balancing them because they understand that if they take too many, then the whole economy will, will collapse. So that gives me a bit of hope for the future. So if you want to learn more about it, go to business.games. And I haven't mentioned that yet, but I'm doing a residency at the v &A at the moment. And my mission there is to, is to promote game making. So doing this kind of hacking, uh, hacking <coughs> activities for people to get started in making games, mostly board games. And also to, to bring the politics back into, into games. So I always like to share this. Oops. This is my mission. <laughs> <laughs> my board game, great game. Right, so let's, let's hack a game. Let's hack a game. Let's hack a game. Let's hack a game. So does anyone not know rock, paper, scissors? Good. So I would like you to spend 10 minutes with two or three people around you hacking this game. And what I mean by hacking is you can change the rules of the game, you can change the elements, you can change the, the story around it, you can add elements, remove elements, <coughs> you can change the winning conditions, you can do whatever you want. We have 10 minutes and after those 10 minutes you can demonstrate it back to us. Okay. And anything goes, there is no such thing as a bad hack of rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah. That's actually a Do you want to join? I made a rock, paper, scissors flash game once, but it was based on the The obvious thing is how they're simple. So, 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 I don't know. <laughs> so you got probably there's more to remember as well. Maybe you could have a team based um, paper
I'm, I, I'm thinking that perhaps it's something we can add. Like to get the lowest score goal. Potentially, so like a double nice It would be in your favour if you won the Your live stream checklist. Kind of trying to, not trying to make all trying to do for better, for a better outcome potentially. But like, something weird like that. One person. Yeah, it's me. So like, um, like, um, Okay. The idea of not possibly winning, like being fairer. Um, yeah. 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 What do you think? Just, 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 just trying to try to keep the winning and losing equal to three parties. Yeah. So like have, 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 a, have a very well balanced. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'm not the worse you get, less options you get. Or if you win, you can do rock or paper, but when you lose, you get Okay, so that's, that's interesting. So if you had cards to represent what you're allowed to pick, yeah, if you had cards to represent what you're allowed to pick, same bread. So, 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 so if, if you win, you have to just have a card, you should pick up a card. Or you get to pick one you just play. So are we going to keep it rock, paper, scissors? Yeah, rock, paper, scissors. So if I lose, I have to get rid of a card, which means that I can only pick two. No, no, if, 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 if you win, you get rid of that card. Right? So you win that point. Um, so like that's the case. Your rock, paper, scissors. I win to this, so I, I get one, but I lose that card. So the next choice, I can only trick with rock or paper. So when I lose, I get to draw another card, which would be scissors or whatever. And then it's trying to win, I get an amount of cards, many cards at the end. So, um, that way, you get down to one card. Which you would lose. <laughs> which you could draw another card from. Nice. So, keep it back up. so, so maybe the other person can't, can't see your card. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and perhaps the perhaps the cards you have, they might not be what they see, and perhaps you have five cards, you can select one of those cards at five. Oh, I see, that's interesting. Yeah. So, but you get an uneven distribution of them. So, when you take a card as and you only deal out, say, half a pack. Or five. Five, 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 five a go. So when, 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 when you win your four cards, when you do, you should pick up a card. Yeah. Yeah. And you just keep on doing that. I'm not even sure you need that. And the random nature of the game means that the power to play is going to be a bunch of spaces. I can send you match to space with my own. Yeah. And I have to like... So if you win, you basically get rid of your card. Yeah. 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 No, no. I, I think I think you should only pick up if you lose. Yeah. yeah. Because then the loser has more chance to win. That's the way I'm doing it. Yeah. 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 So, like, let's say, I win, I won't go back. If I lose, I draw one, and the winner is the person with, like, 10 cards or whatever. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs>
it up too fast. <coughs> so, 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 so let's just assume so, yeah, I got three. Like, Actually, we can do this with um, a diamond. Just take like, one of the suits out. Like, like, just take, like, take clubs out. Got the diamonds. And so, if we have got diamonds, um, so let's uh, say diamonds are there. Well, let's let's all play. Just wrap. Just take one suit out. We'll take parts out. No, I've taken parts out. But you take all the parts. Okay, so to deal it amongst all. Okay. It has to be. Damn it! Damn it! What time? Not five minutes. Five minutes. There we go. No, that's 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 the kind of game I do. Let's start this time from this way. What did you have? Uh, Quickly describe your. Ba basically, we swapped it to a card game where the distribution is random, and yeah. so you basically there's 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 three suits, or each suit represents uh, rock paper scissors, yep. and you draw three at a time, and so every time you win. You keep you put your card down as a point, but you still have two cards in your hand. Mm -hmm. The other player doesn't know if you've got rock, rock or paper, and as you lose, you can draw cards, so you have more opportunities to win. Mm -hmm. But the, the winner is the person who has the most stats who have decided. So, yeah. That's really interesting. <laughs> we should play after. <laughs> <laughs> finished. Okay? Anyone in the back?
the, the way that you've, you've set up the world. Do you want to try to Oh yeah, I'm just wondering what separates dynamics from strategy, I guess it's basically strategy plus behavior. Yeah. Yeah, so that I would say that strategies are encompassed into dynamics. And <coughs> what are the what are the dynamics of Twitter? What sort of behaviors do people have on Twitter based on the mechanics of Twitter? Pick fights with everyone you can. <laughs> yeah. 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 So maybe that the fact that the, the number of followers is one of the main numbers that you can see on mm -hmm. your profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then that encourages people to to get that sort of fine metric. Maybe the time of day that they're tweeting. You know, if you tweet at six o'clock on a Friday, there's no one around to see it. So <laughs> People might be tweeting, depending on what the message is. Yeah. There's this whole tool around tweeting at the right time of day. Yeah, 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 definitely. So, all of the behaviors, all the sort of strategies that people put in place to get the most out of Twitter, to win the Twitter game, if you like, that those could be considered as, as dynamics. So, the reason why I'm talking about this is because I would like to extend the conversation from just making games. If you're designing anything which involves humans, then these ideas of dynamics, mechanics, and aesthetics could be applied. So the aesthetics, it's uh, perhaps a bit confusing because we tend to think of aesthetics in a broader sense as the visuals of something. But in, in this context, aesthetics are the type of fun or the, the type of emotions and experiences that mechanics and dynamics tend to foster. So, again, in the case of chess, the aesthetics of chess are the experience of playing chess being generally quite a silent thing, like a game that encourages thinking <coughs> and strategy. Um, and this is directly connected to the mechanics of chess because there is no hidden information in chess. Everything is out there. So there is no bluffing. There is no negotiation with your opponent, it's a frontal battle, which means that the only thing that the other person doesn't know is what you're going to do next, or what's your game plan. And as a result of that, when you play chess, you tend to zip up, not communicate with your, with your opponent, uh, and, and just play in a very um, militarily strategic way. So, do you know what this is? This example here on screen. It's another hack of chess that was made by Ruth Kaplow a few years ago. So she posted this image on a forum, on various forums of chess, asking under which conditions would the the pawns, the sort of the proletariat of chess, have a a chance of winning. So she asked people to come up with different ideas and different hacks. To, to make to make to make chess a game between the sort of the aristocratic, the sort of the elite versus the the poor say players or the poor elements. Uh, and people came up with a lot of ideas and in the end they, they had a the, the, the winning idea was a three players game where you have the white royalty on one side, the black royalty on the other side. And in the middle you had the, the sort of the workers of the world uniting to to try and stop them from from fighting. So you had the sort of the black and the white royalty trying to destroy each other and the the others in the middle trying to stop them. So it's another way to change the change the game and also change the experience because in a way by by changing but, well, first of all, by introducing another player and by changing the goal of the game, so again, acting on a mechanics level, you totally change the experience of the game. So, let's not look about Twitter, but this is the point of NDA really, is that when you're designing a game, or when you're designing an interactive system, you are acting on the mechanics layer. So, as a designer, you are controlling the, the dynamic, the, the mechanics, 
which in turn will foster certain behaviors, and those behaviors will in turn promote certain feelings, certain some kind of fun, hopefully, when it comes to playing a game. Whereas as a player, you first experience the game, then you may start to think about dynamics, and maybe if you're interested in game design, you will go to the, mecha the mechanics. So when it comes to designing a game, you could start from the mechanics. You could say, I have some ideas about this mechanic that I've seen in another game, and I want to try it out. I want to see what happens if I slightly tweak it. So you could start from that point. Or you could start from the aesthetics. You could say, do I want a game where people shout at each other that has a lot of excitement? Or do I want a game that has a lot of thinking and silence? And based on that, so based on those aesthetic goals, you can then backtrack to the kind of behaviors that you want to get to foster, and then choose or tweak a set of mechanics that would then influence that. So, oops, um, there are a lot of small activities for you. If you work on a project of any kind, not just game design, could be a website, could be you know, anything which, again, involves you, human beings, could you talk to the person next to you and try to describe it in terms of mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics? Go.
without changing any mechanic, without putting any rules in place that sort of force people to be, or encourage, give some reward to people to be nice, then why would people do it? Uh, and, and it sounds quite obvious, but there's a lot of that in, uh, in generally in design. So I find this three-layered approach to analyzing any interactive system quite useful. So, I'm going to talk about the 10 best games in the world now. So this is a book that I bought last year, and it's arguably the 10 best games in the world. There are board games from around the world, from different cultures, different times, and to me they're really interesting because they are a sort of snapshot of a culture at a certain point in time. So and it's not the, the, the obvious like snakes and matters and so on, but it's games that you may not have played before, even though you like you may play a lot of play, a lot of games. And also they're quite abstract. So you can take them as as a playground for them for, for hacking, for creating something new with them. So some of the games that I've made, so I'm I'm doing a project at the moment where I'm hacking all ten of them and I've made seven prototypes out of ten. So hopefully by the end of my residency I'll have ten and there will be more or less playable. My favorite at the moment, so yeah, so what I'm doing is taking those games and turning them into something that puts people in a position where they have to make choices that they may not be comfortable with. So connecting those 10 abstract games to things that happen in our world, in our society, that forces you to make a moral choice, but one that you may or may not be happy to do, and by doing that, you can use games as a way to start a conversation, or to put people in a different position from what they may only uh, experience. So, for instance, this is a game about the so-called sharing economy. So it's inspired by a Maori game, from a tribe from New Zealand, playing this game where you go around a circle. and. When I made this, I was quite interested in the sharing economy and in particular in the way that these kind of disruptive tech companies are talking on one hand about giving people uh, a way to... Is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so how disruptive tech companies on one hand promote this narrative of giving people uh, customers more convenience convenient services, as well as flexible employment. We talk about Uber, Airbnb, and so on. But on the other hand, they're quite, their, their practices are borderline illegal sometimes. When they enter a new city, for instance, they, they disregard regulation, they try to disrupt whatever exists there. And one example of this is Uber, a couple of years ago, used a, used a system they call grey balling. So every time that they enter a new city where it's not regulated, their the present that the sort of market is not regulated, what they would do is add a 
an element to the to the app where if they thought that someone calling a cab was a police person or someone uh, from law enforcement, they would send a ghost car to them instead. So they would show on the on the Uber map cars coming around and your driver would have a fake name and a fake identity, would come to you and then cancel at last minute. So they developed software that was actually purposefully trying to evade law enforcement. So this is quite interesting and they decided to make a game about it. So in this game you play either as Uber or as uh, the rest of us. So it's a two players game. And in this game I wanted to add an element of, of laughing because there is that duality between presenting yourself as a force for good and on the other hand doing really dodgy stuff on, and, and uh, denying that you're doing it. So, I mean, um, I'll, I'll share presenta this presentation, you can go and play it if you want. But the point here is that I took an existing game and it turned into something that I was interested in and I added that uh, layer of uh, a mechanic that, in my opinion, stimulates that sort of lying or that duality uh, to your face. Another example is this is uh, it's called Being Conscious and it's about food. So it's inspired by a very popular game from the Aztec Empire called Patoli. Uh, Patoli means beans in, uh, in their language. So that was the creative spark. We decided to make a game about food and in particular about food choices. So going back to the idea of mean playable dilemma, when, whenever we, we choose food, we, we think of it as just satisfying our hunger or satisfying our social whatever conditions. But food has an impact also on, on the world around us, on communities around the world as well as the planet. So I wanted to make a game that is inspired by this old Mexican game and at the same time has makes you think about what impact your food choices could have on the world. So here you've got a track of cars and each card uh, represents a type of environment or a type of food production and you have a set of cards that represent different food choices and you play cooperatively. So there's two up to I think six, seven at the moment. I've got a I've got a very initial prototype there, so if anyone wants to try it later, we could. And so you take turns picking one of those cards, and each one of the cards will allow you to move forward a certain number of steps, but it also will have an impact on, on the environment. So for instance, let's say that you pick a beef card that's fast food, so it allows you to move forward quite a lot, say up to here, but it also has an impact on the territory, so we would say you can move forward but four, but you have to remove two or three water cards because producing beef is very consuming on, the, on water. Whereas, say, if you pick a organic carrot, you may only move forward one, but you have no connecting <coughs> on the environment. So it's a very early stage process at the moment. We are developing at the DNA with some food experts because there is an exhibition next year about food, food systems in particular. So this will evolve, but it's a very early preview of what will then become a card game as well as a digital game later on. Yeah? Can you find the Yeah, so on the, on the handout, there is, uh, there's a link here, bit.ly, Mateo, 16, 11. If you go there, it's the, it's the presentation as well as lots of other links that we can find more information about it. So what is the uh, avocado thing uh, to The avocado? The other. Yeah. Is that a number or...? Yeah, uh, this, is just a, this is just an example. It could be move, <laughs> move one and have no impact, but probably the avocado will have some impact okay. in, the, in the final game. It's just an example. Cool. And then uh, another game we <coughs> made last year, just before the general election. So this is a simplified map of the, the UK. And I wanted to make a game about the political, si well, the voting system more specific, the um, first past the post system. So as you probably know in this country, 
you have constituencies, and in order to win a constituencies, constituency, you have to be the, the candidate that has the highest percentage. Not necessarily majority, but just the highest percentage. So I made this game where you play uh, with two, it's a game, two players game, and there are two phases. First is campaigning. So when, when you're in the campaign phase, you put down one of your either blue or red tokens in the, in the spots in the map. And then when you covered the whole map, you take turns in removing five of them at a time. So that the second phase is election day. And in election day, you're trying to scoop up blocked, contiguous blocks that give you a majority, but not too much of a majority because that would be you know, not, not convenient in a, in a first past the post system. So it's trying to, do you understand? Yeah? Yes. So for instance here, you've got five blocks and the, the Labour player took three of them, but they could have t taken four, but taking more than what you need to just get a tiny majority would be pointless. Okay? So it's trying to model that kind of system and get a conversation going about it. So, we've been talking about systems quite a lot in the, in the last few slides. And that's because one way to look at games is to consider them as systems. So there is you know, the economic system, the political system, the food system, the ecosystem, the digestive system. But what, what is a system? And I found this book by Camilla Meadows called Thinking in Systems. And I'm currently reading it, so I'm just going to give you what I know about it right now. It's definitely not a comprehensive thing. But I would, I would recommend it. And so she did a lot of studies around the idea of systems and also popularizing what systems are and how we can think about anything in terms of systems. So first of all, what is a system? System, in her definition, is a set of interconnected things that work together to achieve some sort of function or purpose. So, for instance, a system, say, if you take a, a beam in itself, is quite a weak, useless little animal, but if you consider the, the system of a hive, then the bee becomes an element of that system, working together with, with all the other bees to, to create a very complex behavior. So, um, one way to think about what is a system versus what is not a system is that if you, if you were to remove one element from, from the system, would the other element still work in the same way? Would they be affected? So for instance, if you take a pile of rubbish and if you remove some bits out of it, that's not a system because the, the other elements would not be affected by it. Whereas if you think of an ecosystem, if you were to remove or to kill all the predators in that ecosystem, then the other elements, the prey, would be affected. For instance, if you were, and, and there's a lot of studies around this, if you were to remove a predator like a wolf from an ecosystem, then the prey of the wolf would start to reproduce and to grow, and as a result, it would also have an impact on, on the plants that they consume. And as a, as a result, it would have an impact on the soil that would start to get eroded if all the plants that they're using uh, are getting eaten. So one of the common maxims of system thinking is that the whole or the system in itself is more than the sum of its parts. And this is probably something you've heard before, but it's it's quite it's quite important. And and then the other bit about systems is that a system generally has a goal or a purpose and they're not necessarily the same thing. So especially when it comes to human systems, the, the, their stated goal is not necessarily what they achieve. 
So if we can think of, for instance, the education system, the prison system, their state of goal may be different from what they actually achieve. So another maxim of system thinking is that instead of looking at what individual players do, you may be looking at the rules of the game, so looking at the mechanics of the system to understand how people behave in that system. And I've been having this conversation a lot lately uh, with, with people in Italy where I grew up because there is a lot of anti-immigration rhetoric and people look at uh, immigrants as, well, not generally speaking people, but some people look at immigrants as uh, someone that comes to Italy for instance and they steal our jobs, they blah 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 and sometimes I tell them, okay, but first of all Many people in Italy just a couple of generations ago were immigrants themselves, so try to you know, flip, the, flip the perspective and think about what it would be if you were in their position. And then also think about the behaviors that get reported in, in, the, in the news, what may be triggering those behaviors. If you were in the same position, would you behave in the same way? So try to remove the, the focus on one specific case of one specific person that has behaved more or less legally and looking at what may have driven those behaviours, what are the rules of the game that they're playing. Um, yeah, so to summarise, because I can see that people are getting hungry, perhaps a bit <laughs> tired, the, what I'm trying to do is here is by, by getting people, young people, adults to make games I want to promote this kind of system literacy. I want to use games as a way to understand and make sense of current systems, like in, in the business sense, I'll talk about it in a moment, and also to envision different systems. So, a couple more slides and then we're done. <laughs> so, thinking about a game of these and trying to make sense of how could I come up with ways that other people understand and can start to make sense of systems around them. So, what are the elements of the system? Can you list them? Can you start putting them on a diagram or on a, on a drawing? What are the interconnections? So, how do they relate to each other? Uh, how do they influence each other? Uh, are there some sort of currencies in the system? What are the transactions that elements have within the system? What are the purposes of the system in general, as well as the, the elements within the system? So what drives the behavior of the individual players, if you like, as well as the, the, what, is the, what, what is the outcome of the system in general? And then if you want to turn that into a game, what are the aesthetics? So what are your goals? What do you, what do you want people to feel? What do you want people to think? And based on that, you can build your the game system around it. So, in the case of business, for instance, the elements are, broadly speaking, four. So you've got bees representing people, different kinds of jobs. You've got flowers that represent natural resources, or generally public resources. Then you've got honey that represents manufactured products by private companies, by private hives. And you've got money that represents the, the currency of the system. And the way that in which they, they're interconnected is that in order to make money, you need to first pick the flowers or pick something from the flowers. And you need the workers <coughs> to do that. And then you need the drones, which is not biologically correct, but whatever. Um, you need the drones in order to sell the honey back to the market. And you need the queen in order to hire the bees. So I'm kind of twisting the biology, but it's because I want to use the bees metaphor in a, in a different context. And so the interconnections are actually just valid for one version of the business. In, in another version of the game, they will be different. And, and that's, I think, where, where it becomes interesting, because you have the same, system, the same elements, but the way that you pick players against each other, as opposed to asking them to work together, is when then people start to make the connections and think about, oh, okay, so this, for instance, 
one version of this that represents our current economic system. Mm -hmm. And then they think like, oh, okay, but it's not the only possible one. We could, we could envision, we could start prototyping different economic systems. And, and these are the rules that we have to put in place in order to make that happen. So, how does anyone feel at this point? Do you want another <laughs> quick activity or questions? I need to go. You need to go, know. right. So, <laughs> put it on. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Um, cool. So, uh, as I said, these, these slides are, are available and there's a lot of links in the notes if you want to ask with them. Does anyone have any questions? Right. So, that's my email if you want to write me. I'm on Twitter. And if you want to go to business.games, sign up for the newsletter. And every month I send out a newsletter with links to games that I'm playing, articles that I'm reading, dates for playtesting at the VNA. So if you come to London, you're very welcome to come visit me at the VNA. And that's it. Okay, just, one, just one question. Yeah, right. A lot. I, I, it's been brilliant. I really enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I uh, thought you were probably going to talk about video games a bit more than you did, which is absolutely fine because I don't actually. Play I'm just. Yeah. Are you interested in video games as well, or have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I am interested in video games, and I have been also making some video games, but I wanted to keep it at the the lowest. Yeah, I just wanted it like one maybe restrict you from getting.